I'll be presenting work that my students, my collaborators, and I have been doing to find vulnerabilities in hardware designs. In the past year, Spectre, Meltdown, and Foreshadow have shown us just how vulnerable hardware can be. And while these made headlines, they are not the only vulnerabilities in hardware designs. Nor are exploitable bugs in hardware a new phenomenon. And yet there's a relatively modest amount of research being done on the security validation of hardware designs. Compare this to software where the security community has a large knowledge base of the vulnerabilities that can arise and their exploits for a variety of domains, applications, operating systems, web browsers, and we know how each of these can compromise security. We also have shared knowledge about how specific attacks work and what they can achieve. For example, if we look at just buffer overflows, we know of so many sophisticated attack techniques that can be used to exploit a buffer overflow and violate control flow integrity. This knowledge base just continues to grow. This is useful in and of itself, but it's also enabled a wealth of tools to be developed, both from industry and academia, that strengthen our software systems. These tools range from the less formal, like fuzzing, to find bugs that might be exploitable, to slightly more formal program analysis tools that use static analysis or symbolic execution, to languages with well-defined behavior that at the most formal end of things allow us to build provably correct systems. But if we look at the state of the art in hardware security, we are lagging behind. There's some recent research into the development of secure languages for hardware design, and this is promising. But for the most part, manual review is still largely how security validation is done. And if we think about the shared knowledge we have about the vulnerabilities and their exploits in hardware designs, again, we lag behind software security. The research community has studied side channels extensively, and we have a good understanding of this type of vulnerability and some of the ways it can be used to compromise security. And there's been research into transient faults and how those can be compromised to leak secret key information. But by and large, this is it. The kinds of bugs and the resultant vulnerabilities that result from people writing code and making mistakes have been largely ignored. And yet, we know hardware is large and complex and created by people writing thousands and thousands of lines of code. There are bugs in that code, and some of those bugs are exploitable. So hardware security validation needs to catch up. And my research for the past five years has been about doing just that. The question we are asking ourselves is, how can we identify the vulnerabilities and their exploits in hardware designs? There's no simple answer, but it starts with, first, identifying the properties that are critical to security, that if violated would represent an exploitable vulnerability. Second, we need to analyze the potential consequences to security if a property is violated, so that we can better understand the extent to which security may be compromised by any given bug. And finally, our focus has been on hardware designs, which are just pieces of code written by people. The hardware development life cycle has two major, phase, two major phases, design and synthesis and fabrication and package. The hardware design is created early on in the first stage. It is written in a hardware description language and it describes the registers, signals, and ports in the hardware and how data should move through the design at each clock cycle. If we zoom in on a sample design, we see that the hardware description language is a programming language. Hardware designs are written by people writing code. They are large, they are complex, they include code written years ago with different design constraints in mind, and just as is the case for software, hardware designs contain bugs that compromise security. We want to identify the properties that are critical to security, but before we can do that, we need an understanding of the vulnerabilities we have to protect against. What are the bugs that arise in a hardware design and that can compromise security? For this, we started our work with an analysis of the exploitable bugs that exist in current designs. The processors that ship have bugs in them. The laptops you are using right now contain buggy chips. And some of those bugs open up vulnerabilities that can then be exploited by an attacker writing clever software. Companies publish errata lists that describe all the publicly known bugs in current processors. Here's an example of one erratum from AMD. As you can see, the entry is written in English. It does not include code. Registers are only sometimes identified by name. And the description of the effect of the bug, what the consequences might be to security or otherwise, is vague. Unpredictable system behavior. This is not very helpful. So what we did is we looked at seven years worth of published errata lists covering 60 different AMD processors. 
And we were looking to identify those bugs that might provide a foothold for attacks emanating from unprivileged software. Our categorization here is necessarily subjective, but we tried to be conservative and to make the process as systematic as possible. When analyzing each bug, we asked ourselves whether the bug would likely have an effect on privileged state, for example, the processor's current privilege level, page tables, or hardware virtualization registers, or an effect on special events, like taking an exception. In all, we analyzed 301 unique entries and found that 28 fit our definition of security critical. That's just over 9%. Every processor we looked at was affected by at least one security critical bug, and most of the security critical bugs had no fix listed. The question we were looking to answer here was, what are the vulnerabilities, and what is it that we need to protect against? In order to understand this a little better, we examined the security critical errata we collected to find what they have in common and how they might be categorized and understood. We focused here on the effect of the bug, not how that effect is achieved. And we developed five classes that nicely organized the data. The first is exception related. And this is a bug that results in the processor ignoring an exception that should be handled or vice versa or passing control to the wrong exception handler. The second is incorrect results in which an operation does not correctly update state after an instruction commits. The third is memory access in which software is able to access memory it should not be able to. The fourth is incorrect instruction, in which the wrong instruction gets executed. For example, a call instruction gets treated as a no-op. And the last category is register-related, in which the wrong value is read from or written to a privileged register that is visible to software. The outcome of that project was a better understanding of the types of vulnerabilities that exist. Once we had that, we set ourselves the task of writing a set of properties that if somehow were enforced of a given design would strengthen the security of the processor. We started by studying the instruction set architecture, the specification of the OR1200 open source risk processor to determine just through our knowledge of the architecture and our background in security, what are the core properties that should be enforced? That if enforced would protect the processor from exploitable vulnerabilities. Through this exercise, we developed 14 properties that are critical to security. For example, in the OR1200 processor, a mode change from low privilege to high privilege should only occur through an exception or a reset. If privilege escalates through any other means, it would be a violation of this property, and it would indicate a bug in the hardware design that allowed such an escalation. We then studied the AMD errata and identified three more properties that were violated by one of the bugs we had found to be exploitable. An example of one of these properties is that when a registered value changes in the processor core, it should be the target of the executing instruction. No errant modifications to software visible registers. Finally, we added each of the 17 properties to the design of the OR1200 processor as assertions, and we ran the processor in simulation. We wrote into the design each of the 28 security bugs we had pulled from the AMD documents, and we tested whether our 17 properties would be sufficient to find these bugs would the assertions fire when the bug was triggered? And we found we needed one more property. This property says that once an instruction is fetched, it does not change as it passes through the pipeline. This property is different from the others in that it is stated over microarchitectural state. All the other properties are concerned with and enforceable over software visible state only. The outcome of this research was a better understanding of the kinds of bugs we are seeing in our processor designs and which of those bugs might be exploitable and how we might formulate the properties we should be verifying in order to strengthen the security of our designs. In our next project, our aim was to move away from the labor-intensive manual approach to security property specification. There exists a line of research on specification mining for hardware designs. There are many ways it is done, but the basic idea is to look for instances of some pattern in the design. Dynamic specification mining takes in traces of execution and templates describing patterns of interest and produces a set of property. Typically, tens of thousands of properties might be generated. For example, it might look for instances of one-hot encoding, which says that only one bit of a register should ever be set at any time. If, over many traces of execution, the control register always seems to take one of these three values, the specification miner might produce a property that says the control register should enforce one-hot encoding. For purposes of functional validation, this is enough. It looks like the control signal should enforce one-hot encoding, Testers and verifiers can then go look for violations of this property and start debugging if they find any. But for security validation, this is not helpful. Maybe it's 
important for the security, maybe the control signal is important for security, and maybe it's important that the control signal enforces one hot encoding, but maybe it's not, and we just don't know. And nor is it obvious which patterns we could add that might be useful here. So we built on the idea of a specification miner, but instead of relying on a set of patterns, we rely on known security bugs instead. The basic idea is this. We use an existing specification miner to generate a large set of properties for a given design. And from this set, we identify those properties that express important security properties. To do that, we look to known bugs. Processor bugs in the design for which we could demonstrate an exploit. These bugs, by definition, violate some property, although that property might not be stated anywhere. So the question is, what is the property that they are violating? Well, we look to a large set of generated properties, and we identify which of those were generated by each given exploitable bug. The approach is relatively simple, but we find that it works in practice. In the second step, we, ap we apply machine learning to identify additional properties from our set of generated properties that may be critical for security, but for which we didn't have a known bug that violated the property. We evaluated our toolchain on the OR1200, an open source risk processor. We collected security bugs by combing the commit histories of source repositories, looking at developers' archives, looking at the Bugzilla and Bug Tracker databases, um, and looking at comments in the source code. We uh, found bugs from five different designs covering four different architectures OR1200, Spark V8, Ultra Spark, and MSP430. And we compared the set of security properties we produced to the existing state of the art, which is a fully manual approach. We looked to the literature, including our own previous project, and we found 22 manually written properties. Our tool, SCI Finder, generates 19 of those. 11 are found in the first step. We have an exploitable bug that violates the property, and we identify it as security critical. Eight more properties are found in step two. We didn't have an exploitable bug that violates the property, but our model labels it as security critical. There are three manually written properties from prior work that SCI Finder did not generate. Two of them represent properties never produced by our miner. One of them was produced by our miner, but our tool did not identify it as critical to security. We didn't have a bug that exploited the, or violated the property, and our model did not label it as security critical. But SCI Finder produced three new properties not identified in prior work. An example of one of these is that the link register should not change during a function call. It's used to store the return address. This property is critical to protecting control flow integrity, but had not been expressed by prior manual efforts. So the cool thing about this work is that it points to the fact that we can take lessons learned from one hardware design and apply it to a second design, even across different architectures. The next piece of the puzzle is how best to understand the possible threat for any given property violation. And here, we look again to the software security community, which has had a lot of success using symbolic execution to explore code. We want to understand what is the consequence to security if a property is violated. With symbolic execution, input values are replaced with symbolic values, and the program is executed with these symbols in place of concrete literals. When a branch point is reached, for example, an if statement, program execution forks, and each branch is explored in turn. The result of symbolic execution is a tree, and each path from root to leaf in the tree represents one possible path through the program. The power of symbolic execution is in its ability to explore many different paths, providing higher coverage than is likely achieved through uh, any set of concrete test vectors. If we symbolically explore a hardware design, the resulting tree of paths represents the exploration of the design for a single clock cycle. In the open source RISC CPUs we've been looking at, this corresponds to an, a single instruction commit. But it's likely that a property violation may require a sequence of instructions to take the processor from its initial reset state to the violating state. In this case, the space of paths to explore would grow exponentially. The search is just not feasible. So our solution is to search backward. We add a property to the design in, a form of an, uh, in the form of an insertion, and we explore, ex symbolically explore the design for a single clock cycle and find a path from the root node of the tree, representing some intermediate state, to the leaf node that violates our assertion. And we repeat. At each iteration, we explore for a single clock cycle, looking for a path from root node to a leaf node that matches the root found in the prior iteration. At the end of this process, a sequence of concrete instructions is output. This sequence of instructions represents a trigger for the assertion violation. 
the processor starting in its initial state and executing this sequence of instructions will end up in a state that violates the given property. There's no guarantee the search will converge. It may be that the intermediate state found in the first iteration is an unreachable state. It may be a reachable state, but the path we're exploring is not taking us back to the processor's initial state. So we introduced some heuristics to make this work in practice. In the first iteration, the engine initializes input and state values to be symbolic and explores the processor design for a complete clock cycle. But in subsequent iterations, input signals are still symbolic, but internal signals may be partially concrete or fully concrete. When the engine encounters an assertion violation, it produces a path constraint describing the precondition necessary to reach that error state. If the processor's initial state can satisfy the constraint, the backward symbolic execution engine is done and it outputs the trigger instructions. If the processor's initial state does not satisfy the constraint, the tool uses some heuristics to eliminate intermediate states that are less likely to take us back to the initial state. We define distance from the initial state as the number of registers that differ from their initial value. And if the current state differs too much from the initial state, we throw out the path and we restart the search. Acceptable distance is a tunable parameter to the tool. We also check to see if we're in a loop. And at each iteration, the engine checks whether the sequence of instructions generated so far has exceeded a bound. And the size of the bound, again, is a tunable parameter to the engine. So we implemented our tool, and we evaluated it again on the OR1200 processor. The first thing we wanted to ask was, will we be able to find bugs in a design? To evaluate this, we wanted a set of known bugs that we knew were there. We were looking to see if we could find them. So we took our bugs that we had collected, looking at bug trackers and databases, and we put 31 bugs into the design of the OR1200 processor. We used the set of properties that we have developed in our own work and added them as assertions, and looked to see, will we find these bugs? Out of 31 bugs, we were able to find 29. One, we were not able to find because we had no corresponding property that the bug was violating. So our set of properties was incomplete. We wouldn't have been able to find this bug. Um, and one we were unable to find, it was outside of the, the processor core, which is where we were focusing our search. We also compared our tool to two model checking tools. We compared to the commercial uh, IFE tool and also to the open source EBMC model checking tool. And in both cases, those tools found a subset of the bugs that we were able to find. And of the bugs that they found, the tools did not always return a replayable sequence of instructions, meaning sometimes the instructions started from some intermediate processor state, not the initial state. And it would be up to the verifier to figure out how to get the processor from its initial state to this intermediate state. We then explore two new designs that we had not used in our development of the tool or our set of properties in the last work. Again, we insert our set of properties as assertions and explore looking for assertion violations. And we find four new properties. So the MOR1KX Espresso is a OR1000 architecture. It's a next generation design from the OR1200. And here we found that a bug that existed in the OR1200 also existed, persisted to this next generation. And so this is useful. You can use properties developed in one design to look at future designs within the same architecture. This is great. And then the RISC-V architecture, this was a new architecture. We had not pulled any of our bugs from RISC-V architectures. And so this is also a really nice finding. This shows that properties developed by studying other architectures, other designs, are useful in exploring and finding bugs, exploitable bugs, in a new architecture, still within the open source RISC family of processors. Going forward. We have only begun to scratch the surface of what is possible and what is needed to ensure the security of our processors. Going forward, we will be building the tools and knowledge necessary to prevent the next media firestorm. So please join us. Check out our webpage. Post it here. You can Google hardware security at UNC. There you will find our papers and also our GitHub repo with the symbolic execution engine and the properties. The code will be up there as well. We need to build a community of folks working on hardware security validation. We need to show the security folks how it's done. Thank you.